Hello everyone, I welcome you all to this session. In this session, we are going to address our topic titled as Image Formation and Representation into the subject Image Processing and Machine Vision. So, as far as the information is concerned, now in this subject, the information is displayed into the image form. So, first of all, what exactly the way with the image is formed and how the representation into the mathematical and further in this domain we shall see here. So here our topic is image formation and representation here. So very first of all we shall talk about the digital image processing field. So the digital image processing field has a basic foundation with a background from mathematical formulations. Those are especially of the probabilistic type here. So we say that the foundation for the field of digital image processing is of the mathematical and the probabilistic formulations here. Now, as a human being, when we need to have the interpretation of the images and to have the analysis into our mind, we have a central door and we have to choose the various digital image processing techniques. So, based on the subjective way and the visual judgments we make all these get done here. Now, therefore, as from human part, the subjectiveness and visual judgments of the image is there, it is very very necessary to have a solid understanding of the human vision perspective also. And for being image processing engineer also, the basic understanding of the human vision perspective as well as what way the image is formed, how the image is represented. So, these things we are going to cover in this particular session. So, the two points are very important to have understanding. So, the first point I say that it is the mechanics of the human visual system we shall be detailing with and the second one image formation into the eye and its capabilities for the brightness adaption and the discrimination. Now the things may be looking theoretical here but as I uh, go into the details for the structure of the human eye, how exactly the image will be forming here and we shall dip, uh, switch to the digital images, this will be quite interesting here. So here we have the two points, the first one the mechanics of the human visual system and the second one here we have the image formation here. Regarding the first point we can say that the mechanics and the parameters those are related to how the images are formed and pursued by the human vision are definitely of the key interest and secondly whatever the limitations the human vision is having in physicalness these limitation in terms of the resolution and the ability to have adaptation to whatever the changes into the illumination of the objects under the scenario is there. So these are of course important as far as the practical working on to the digital images is there. So therefore we are having our focus on these two points here. Now starting with the first one that it is the mechanics of the human visual system. So this human visual system is having the two primary components here. So first one is the eye and second is the brain and those are connected by the optic nerve here. So now when we compare this human visual system the structure with the one we are handling here that the eye which is basically sensing the visual information from the surroundings whatever we see is nothing but a camera or a scanner here. When we talk about our brain which gets this information for processing purpose after analysis we come to a certain decision. So this is nothing but a certain kind of a processor or in general we can call it to be a computer system here. And next to that the one which joins or communicates between this sensor that it is the eye in the case of human visual system and the brain to process the information that it has sensed here that it is the optic nerve so it works as like the connection cable between the sensor and the processor here so this is basically a physical wire 
so the system for having the digital image formed is the one camera computer system and the physical wire here we have the three important things here so the two are most important and then the connection between the two is also of course the important here hence we have three points in total here now as per as the objects into the scenario are concerned there should be the illumination of those objects and the reflection should be sensed by the sensor here so there is a role of electromagnetic radiation also most of the time this electromagnetic radiation is provided by the sun so that time we call these images to be the optical images here or sometimes whatever the imaging sensor is there as like in the case of human visual system our eye is there but it does not emit or illuminate the objects by its own here there should be certain another illuminator here so in the cases of certain instruments the digital techniques we have when the illumination is made possible by those artificial illuminators so that time we say that the sensing of information is by the active way here so the role of electromagnetic radiation what we call in abbreviation as emr that can be emitted by the objects also so this is also of course of much importance here now as far as the human visual system is concerned the sensor as we said i it is there it senses to the electromagnetic radiation basically the light waves those are mostly available from the sunlight here so the wavelength in the range 400 to 700 nanometer can be sensed by the human beings here now the differentiation of color as we see into the scenario so as perceived by our eye is nothing but the hue component generally we say here so this hue component is related to the wavelength into the light that has illuminated and has been reflected from the object under scenario here and the next one is how much a brightness is there in that particular illuminating light and this brightness part is related to the intensity of the radiation intensity basically we measure in terms of lux here now for the human vision we have the three functions to do the first function is discrimination of the figure from the background here so judging whether it is a food or a rock so that is nothing but the discrimination of the object or figure we can say here second one detection of the movement so as like in the case of predator and prey there it is a movement so the detection is also a function of the vision and lastly that is much more important uh, which create interest into the images also that it is nothing but the detection of the color so which is basically adaptive value of the color vision here now concerning these three functions and the role of electromagnetic radiation here we go to one diagram where we have the various ranges for the radiation here so the electromagnetic energy or electromagnetic waves in general we can say that so the waves are having the varied frequency ranges or the wavelength ranges wavelength and frequency both are related to each other the inverse relation here so in terms of wavelengths in meters as we go from 10 raised to the power minus 15 on negative side that it is left hand side and up to 10 raised to power 3 here we go from cosmic rays then gamma rays then we have x rays we have ultraviolet rays then the visible range then infrared microwaves radar tv fm am radio waves and the short waves so these different frequency ranges those have been designated in this particular diagram shows a different behavior for the electromagnetic waves and based on those behaviors we have lot many information communication applications to our day to day life here now as we see this entire frequency range here the markings are in terms of the wavelengths we can convert into the frequency also the visible spectrum range is of very short span here now if we have magnification to this visible spectrum range 
we have the markings around 400 nanometers to 750 nanometers so as we say with goyer so from violet indigo blue and green then we have yellow orange red so this way the seven colors with the different ranges in terms of the nanometers can be seen in this visible spectrum here so from the seven colors as we have the magnification of the visible spectrum here the three colors are basically very important here and the three colors are nothing but the blue green and red here so we can say that the visible spectrum can basically be can be divided into the three bands where we have the blue ranging from 400 to 500 nanometers green ranging from 500 to 600 nanometers and finally the red that can span from 600 to 700 nanometer so this is the approximate ranges we have differentiation for the entire visible spectrum here now there should be a sensor that senses this particular visible spectral ranges here so as we are dealing with the human visual system the sensor basically we have talked about the eye there it is a retina the most important thing into the eye because of which we have a vision so this is basically the sensor and these are distributed across this retina part here so let us have more details with respect to first of all anatomy of the human eye or simply we can say structure of the human eye here so as far as the physical dimensions the shape of the eye is concerned we can say that eye is nearly a spheroid here a sphere and the diameter as far as the dimensions are there the approximate value is 20 millimeters here now with respect to the structure what different parts are there into the human eye we come to have the three most important membranes those are formed by the tissues and cells here the first one is the cornea and sclera which forms the outer cover of the human eye the second one is the choroid and the third one most important to sense the scenario in the surroundings is the retina here so one by one we shall go into the details of the three membranes here first of all we shall have a simple diagram which will give you the insights of the structure of the human eye so here it is the diagram now as we see here it is basically of spherical shape so this is the front portion of the human eye this is the back portion that has been connected with the help of nerve and shelf inside our body here now as we have talked about the cornea and sclera here it is the nomenclature provided to the cornea which is for the anterior part we shall definitely discuss then the sclera here we have the choroid along with the choroid we have the ciliary fibers or ciliary muscles we call about and then we have the lens also and on to the posterior part we have the retina there it is also a blind spot we shall definitely discuss the fovea here the dashed line you can see right from outside to the back portion of the human eye what we call it to be the visual axis here and whatever the internal material is filled up this is nothing but the vitreous humor and into the front portion we have the anterior chamber here so one by one we shall be discussing about the three important membranes here so very first of all we get this diagram onto the right hand side and we shall talk about the first important part that is of cornea so cornea is basically the toughest part into the eye here and uh, it is a transparent tissue that covers the front side of the human eye here now along with this cornea there it is continuation of the sclera which covers the entire eye but as we have the cornea to be of the transparent type of the tissues sclera is not transparent it is opaque here so finally with the cornea and that of the sclera the eye is completely covered here it has been 
enclosed here. So next part is the choroid here. So this choroid as I have already shown you into the diagram here. This is directly below the sclera and it contains the blood vessels. Those have the major source of certain nutrition that can be provided to the eye here. Now whatever the choroid we see here to cover the eye here, it has the heavy pigmentation and because of the heavy pigmentation, there it is a reduction into the amount of the externus or the unwanted amount of the light that will try to enter into the eye through the lens and would cause the backscattering within the optic globe here. More information with respect to the choroid can be given as it is into the anterior extrema here. It can be divided into the ciliary body and the iris here. So into the figure we have shown as the ciliary body and here it is the iris. Now this iris can have the movement. The iris can have the contraction or the expansion also and this is all to have control over the amount of light that the person wants to have entry into his or her eye here. Now whatever the central opening of the eye has been shown here with the nomenclature as the iris here. The opening is basically the pupil and it can vary into the diameter from the approximate value of 2 to 8 millimeters here. So the physical dimension of the entire eye we have already discussed and that is approximately of 20 millimeters whereas the opening of the eye is of approximate dimensions 2 to 8 millimeters here. Now the next important part is the lens which will carry us to the third important membrane that it is nothing but the retina here. So talking about the lens here, it is made up of the concentric layers of fibrous cells and is suspended by the fibers that attach to the ciliary body as we have shown in this particular diagram here. Now this particular lens has the capability of absorbing approximate 8% of the visible light spectrum as I have shown you into the diagram having the electromagnetic wave ranges here that we can abbreviate to be the electromagnetic spectrum or simply light spectrum here. So this has a relatively higher absorption at the shorter wavelength ranges here. Now we come to the most important portion that it is the retina which is the innermost membrane of the eye as we have shown here. So here it is the retina and this lines the inside wall of the entire posterior region. So this is the posterior back side which has been lined up by complete retina as you can see here. Now when this eye is properly focused with the scenario here, the light from the object outside the eye is imaged onto this retina here. Now in this retina there should be something which actually senses the information here. So these are basically called as the receptor cells. So the two types of the receptor cells are there into the eye which are cones and the rods here. So there it is a concentration of these cones and rods into the millions here. We have for the cones the value between 6 to 7 million here. And these are primarily located into the central region. And this central region is called as the fovea. And this particular region is very very sensitive to the color here. So because of the existence of the cones here, we can have differentiation between the different objects based on to the color identification here. So as far as this type of vision is concerned, we can simply call it to be the cone vision. It is called as photopic or bright light vision here. Now there are other types of the receptor cells also as we have just now said those are the rods here. So the number of rods are more than those of the cones here. The rods are much larger. The value ranges in between 75 to 150 million and the location is onto the retinal surface here. 
so because of the existence of these cones and the rods we can say the retina is very very important for the visualization now getting to more information for the rods here these rods basically give a general and overall picture of the scenario or what we call as the field of view here and these rods are not involved into the color differentiation that is the work of the first type of the receptors what we have called to be the cones here now they are having the sensitivity at low level illumination also now whatever the vision that we have because of this particular cell receptors we can say the phenomenon by the scotopic or the dim light vision here so we have the cones and rods which are of very much importance for the visualization here so that our human visual system can work properly most of the time as per as the examinations are concerned there may be the theoretical questions as like get the differentiation between the cones and the rods so here we have few important points with respect to the cone so here the cone is for the daylight vision it is sensitive to the color it has concentration into the central region what we call fovea it has high resolution capability so that we can have differentiation of the small changes the number lies in 6 to 7 millions and the fine details can be resolved due to the cones here on other hand we have the rods so the points we can compare with the cone as like rods can be giving us the night vision they see only the brightness hence the image can be of the gray level type here not the color image no color differentiation so the location of the rods they have been distributed across the retina that it is the posterior part of the human eye here it has the low level resolution medium to low the number lies between 75 to 150 million as we have already discussed and they serve to give a general vision overall picture of the field of the view or the scenario under consideration here so these are the various point important while differentiating these two most important receptors or the senses we can say those are rods and the cones here now more information can be added to these cones that they have higher resolution than the rods also and this is because they have the individual nerves tied to each of the senses here whereas in the case of rod on to the right hand side they have multiple sensors tied to each and every nerve here hence rod can react even at the low light but see only a single spectral band so because of the sense having the single spectral band not into the multiple spectral band we don't have the color differentiation so they cannot distinguish the color here now let us have a figure that will show us the variation of the density of rods and cones in the eye here that is the right operating eye here and it has the region of emergence of the optic nerve from the eye here so here it is the diagram so in this diagram we have the graphical diagram on to the horizontal axis we have the values into the degrees so these are from the visual axis on to the left hand side also they vary from 0 degree to 20 degree 40 degree 60 degree 80 degree and on to the right hand side also we have the same variation here so this has the variation from center of fovea we can say now on to the vertical axis we have the concentration of these receptor cells that the number of rods or cones and this is per square millimeter here the range we express in terms of 45000 90000 1 35000 1 80000 here we have blind spot represented in this diagram which i'll discuss about here and the concentration of the cones is shown by the solid lines here it is here we have a pick and we have the concentration of the rods shown by the dashed lines like this here so we shall discuss about these things so we first of all come to the first receptor that it is the cone so cones are 
having much more density at the center of the retina hence we have such a peak here now we have rods also the rods have increase of the density from the center and towards the periphery here so approximately 20 degrees of the axis and then decrease into the density out to the extreme periphery of the retina we have observed here now we can have the imagination also the fovea as a sensor the sensor of let us say for example square size here or sensor array here and it has the physical dimensions approximately of 1.5 millimeters by 1.5 millimeters here so this is the natural sensor that can sense the scenario to our surrounding and it can have generation of the images here and today's digital image processing sensors are just mimicking this natural sensor here and to look at this particular mechanism they have been generated and they are working in today's era here now we have the blind spot as shown in this particular diagram here regarding this blind spot we can say that there are no location of the sensors here so this is basically the place for the optic nerve and we don't even pursue it as a blind spot because our processor that it is the brain fills the information of the missing visual contents here now there may be a question why does an object should be in the center of the field of vision in order to have perceive it into the fine details so this is where the cones are concentrated and because of the cones we can have the proper discrimination of the object from the others or the background we can see here so let us have more focus on to the image formation the structure of the human eye just now we have discussed i hope it is sufficient so let us switch to the image formation the first important topic we have in our title so in the case of ordinary photographic camera we come to the digital instrumentation system here we have the important one that it is the lens as like the retina in the case of human eye here so it has a fixed focal length and the focusing at various distances is achieved by the variation of the distance here now this is the case with the digital camera now when we compare it with the mechanics of the human visual system we come to see opposite mechanism here so it has been made possible so the distance between the lens and the imaging region is fixed in the human eye whereas the variation is made for obtaining the particular images here by varying the shape of the lens so this way we have the formation of the image into the eye here now as far as the distance between the center of the lens as we have seen the figure and the retina which holds the image in inverted form basically so this approximate distance is of 17 millimeters we remember that the approximate dimension of the complete eye is of 20 millimeter so the lens is on to the anterior or the front side whereas retina is on the back side so this is suitably 17 millimeters here now the complete range of the focus length that can be in the range let us say 14 millimeter to 17 millimeter the second one taking place when the eye is relaxed and it has the complete range here so it has the distances greater than about 3 meters also so now let us have the geometry that can be visualized with the help of the next figure that has the illustration how to have the dimensions for the image form accessed here onto the retina here so let us visualize the object under scenario so here onto the left hand side we have the object the coconut tree in general and it has the approximate height of 15 meters here and here it is the sensor that it is the human eye which senses this particular information this way and the image into the inverted form is generated onto the posterior portion that it is the retina here so as just now we have discussed about this dimension is of 17 millimeters whereas the distance 
from the center here it is the lens located here up to the object here it is of the 100 meters here so if you take the example case here that a person is looking at a tree that has the 15 meters of the height as i have shown you and it is situated 100 meters far here so let us have certain nomenclature where we define small h as a parameter that denotes the height of the object that it is 15 meters here and we have the geometry that gives us the value of the h so 15 divided by the 100 so it gives h divided by 17 and h is equal to 2.55 mm onto the retina whereas in practically it has 15 meters the value here now this retinal image is basically focused onto the region of the fovea the structure we have already seen here and finally we need to have the image perception here so the perception takes to the place of the relative excitation of the light receptors which transforms the radiant energy into the electrical impulses that ultimately are decoded by the brain here now this information can also be expressed in terms of other words how the human visual system works so we have the three points so the first point is light energy is focused by the lens onto the eye into the sensors and the retina secondly the sensors respond to the light by electrochemical reaction that sends electrical signal to the brain and at last the brain uses the signals to create the neurological patterns that we perceive as images here now the first portion of our today's topic that is image formation and then further the representation the first part is mostly covered here now we should have uh, certain notes with respect to how the brightness adaptation of this particular images that has been formed here we should know so we come to have few details for the brightness adaptation and discrimination here now we have the human eye and it has the ability to have differentiate between the different intensity levels also as well as differentiating different colors also now as far as the brightness adaptation is concerned we shall focus on to the different intensity levels here we have the range of such light intensity in which the human visual system can have adaptation so this is of the order of 10 raised to the power 10 so from the scotopic that uh, does not have the color differentiation here we have this threshold value to the glare limit here we shall definitely show the graphical representations also and whatever the experimentation evidence we have to today's research here we have the indication that the subjective brightness is a logarithmic function of the light intensity that is incident onto the eye so this logarithmic function can be shown with the help of this particular graphical representation that you can find into the textbooks also so here it is the log of the intensity and here we have the scotopic threshold value the scotopic region here and here it is the glare limit that we have talked about and here it is the way with which the changes we find here so this way the adaptation max for the brightness here now what is the important part in this particular changes that the interpretation of the impressive dynamic range depicted in that visual system cannot have the operation over such a range simultaneously here uh, rather it accomplishes this large variation by changing its overall sensitivity a phenomena that uh, is basically known as the brightness adaptation here and for any given set of conditions the current sensitivity level of the visual system is called the brightness adaptation level here now with this we shall move forward as we have said that the eye is having the ability to have discrimination between the changes of the light intensity so the scotopic region here so at any specific adaptation level it is also of the considerable interest here now let us have a simple experiment a classical experiment here so this is basically used to have determining the capability of the human visual system for brightness discrimination here now the area that is typically a diffuser such as opaque glass 
that is illuminated from behind by a light source whose intensity can be denoted by capital I here. It can be varied here. And to this field, it is added to an increment of the illusion in the form of the short duration flash that appears as a circle onto the center of the uniformly illuminated field. So, this particular short circle can be shown with the help of this diagram. So, here we have the complete I here represented and here it is the circle which has I added by the delta I here. So, when we talk about the quantity delta I, we can take the ratio delta I C divided by I. So, this delta I C is the how much changes we have made. So, in this case, we consider it for the incrementation of the illumination. That is discriminable by 50% of the time with background illumination capital I as shown in the earlier diagram. So, this is basically called as the Weber ratio and all this information can be treated as the Weber's definition of illumination here. So, this illumination is with respect to the front objects and the background also. Now, here when we take a small value of delta IC by capital I, this means that a small percentage of change into the intensity is discriminable and this has the good brightness discrimination here. Conversely, when we have this ratio delta IC by I at a large value, so it gives us a recognition of the large percentage of changes into the intensity and this represents the poor brightness discrimination here. So these are the two ways. Now we shall have a focus on to a plot of the logarithmic value of this particular ratio delta IC divided by I which is a function of logarithmic I. So let us visualize with the help of this particular diagram here on to the horizontal axis we have the plot of log I that we have at center the zero value and which ranges negative onto the left hand side minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4 onto the right hand side we have 1, 2, 3, 4 and the logarithm of this particular ratio as just now we have discussed the two examples here here it ranges so from 0 as we go downwards we have minus 0 0.5, minus 1, minus 1 1.5, minus 2 and here upwards we have increasing and here it is the nature of the graph here. Now, as we have this particular plot, which is basically of the function of log i, the general shape here we have and this curvature shows that the brightness discrimination is poor as per the Weber ratio or the Weber definition we can say when its value is large at the low levels of illumination. And we have the improvision into the visualization at a significant level when this ratio decreases as the background illumination increases. So, this is basically the definition of the contrast as per the research of the Weber here. Now, we move forward. So, now here we take one figure here where we have the different shades of the intensity here. So, as we see on to the left hand side, we have a very dark shade which has got lighter as we move forward from left hand side to the right hand side here. Now, next to that downwards here we have the intensity levels at actual cases and the intensity levels at the pursued cases by the human eye here. So, here although the intensity of whatever the changes we have here in this particular figure though looking very constant here which having the perception having a fluctuation here. So, this is strongly scaffold near the boundaries here and these seemingly scaffold bands which are called as the match bands after the Ernst match who has invented it into the year 1865 here. In the similar fashion we have another example also. In this example we have the intensity differentiation by the help of these three figures here. As you can see the central region here. Central region here has a constant intensity level whereas there is a variation into the background here. So, here we can talk about the second phenomenon which can be called as a simultaneous contrast here. 
and it is related to the fact of the region's pursued brightness that does not depend simply on its intensity value here. So, as I have already said here, the constant intensity component we have at the center here, and this appears to the eye to become darker as we have the background gets more lighter here. So, this is what the example we have with respect to the brightness adaptation also. Now, the third example can also be given with the help of this particular diagram. So, for human perception phenomena, the optical illusions are expressed or shown in this particular diagram. The eye fills in the non-existing information or wrongly perceives the geometrical properties of the object here. So, as we go through the four parts as we have shown in this particular diagram, the outline of the square can be seen clearly into the first part, whereas it is not continuous here. Next to that, when we go for the same effect, this time with the help of a circle here. Now, the two horizontal line segments that are of the same length, but one appears shorter than the other into the portion that has been shown below this particular first part here. So, this is the first part we have talked about. This is the second part. The length of these two is the same, but the first one appears to be of the smaller here. Next to that, all the lines that are oriented at the 45 degree are equidistant and parallel, yet the cross hashing creates the illusion that those lines are far from being parallel here. So, this way we have this example for the intensity variations here and illusion cases here. Now, let us have a brief information with respect to the electromagnetic radiation which is the important part for having the illumination of the object and then its reflection here. So, this is just the information with respect to the light and the electromagnetic spectrum. As we all know, the Isaac Newton has a great research on this particular domain that it was in the year 1666 here. So, he has discovered that when a beam of sunlight is passed through the glass prism, the emerging beam of the light is not white but consists of the seven parts here. So, the seven parts we have already shown onto the electromagnetic spectrum diagram here. So, whatever the range of the colors we pursue, what we have called the visible frequency range here. So, it is a very small portion we have already talked about. So, here we have the electromagnetic spectrum. So, in this particular diagram, unlike the previous one we have talked about, here we have the variation shown in the cases of wavelength also in terms of wavelength in meters, in terms of frequency also the measuring unit is hertz and in terms of photon energy also, in terms of the unit electron volts also. So, this was the another figure we have already gone through. So, it is very clear that a very short span of the frequency range covers the visible range here. Now, as we see light it is basically a light wave. So, wave can be shown like this, the wavelength measurement from crest to crest can be denoted by lambda which is basically the wavelength here. So, the relation between the frequency and wavelength can be expressed by this particular expression lambda is equal to c by v here. The energy of the various components can be expressed by the capital E. So, here it is the expression capital E is equal to h times v, v representing the electromagnetic frequency here. So, here we have the electromagnetic waves that can be visualized as the propagating sinusoidal waves with the wavelength or they can be thought as a stream of massless particles each traveling into the wave-like pattern and moving as at the speed of the light here. So, whatever the masses of the particles we contain a certain amount of or a bundle of energy each bundle of energy is called as a photon as we have shown on the earlier diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum here. Now, the equations we have shown here, the energy here it is proportional to the frequency value, it is directly proportional. So, the higher the frequency value, the energy associated with the radiation is higher. So, therefore, we have few of the important points marked with respect to this understanding. 
that first one radio waves have photons with low energies these are on to the left hand side of the figure second one microwaves has more energy than the radio waves third one infrared is still having it more than visible which is of more concern to us then the ultraviolet x rays and finally the gamma rays and the most energy at all here so this is the reason why gamma rays are so dangerous to the living organisms here so as we know light is basically a particular type of the electromagnetic radiation that can be sensed by the human eye so the structure of the human eye we have seen the information with respect to the what exactly the light is that we have seen now whatever the colors that human perceive into the object that also i have shown on to the electromagnetic spectrum diagram here so this can be determined by the nature of the light that has been reflected by the object so in the reflection what range it is there for the wavelengths so based on that our human eye perceives the color that here it is a green here it is the red here so this way so the example if we take if the range of the wavelength is between 500 to 570 nanometers of the observation we have the green light detected here so light that is void of the color we call it to be the monochromatic or achromatic light here now chromaticity means the value of certain frequency ranges concerning the color bands here so here it is the definition of the chromaticity here the additional details with respect to the frequency the three band we have the quantities like the radiance luminance and the brightness brightness we have already talked about radiance is the total amount of the energy that flows from the light source and it is usually measured in terms of the wattages here here it is the definition of the luminance that is measured into the lumens here it gives a measure of the amount of energy an observer perceives from the light source here and here it is the brightness the brightness adaptation we have already seen here so whatever the part of the infrared band choose close to the visible spectrum is called the near infrared region there are certain satellite sensors which senses the information from the objects on to the earth surface at this particular range also but it is not there into the human eye so as far as our subject digital image processing and further the machine vision is concerned so we need to study the various imaging sensors that cover these particular frequency ranges here so the opposite to this particular band we have the far infrared region also now talking about the principle here for the sensing of the information the sensor we have to develop and today the scientists have developed it this is capable of detecting the energy radiated by a band of electromagnetic spectrum so we can have the imaging events of our interest now it is very very important that the wavelength of electromagnetic wave required to see an object must be of the same size as of the smaller than the object here so here this is the limitation along with the physical properties of the sensor material that has established a fundamental limits on to the capability of imaging sensor as like the cases of visible infrared and other sensors we have been using in our today's life here now talking about the imaging sensing or the sensors and its particular acquisition of the information we have the different information regarding absorption of the energy here the illumination of the objects we come to have the sensors which sense this particular energy here which can be particularly processed by further the processor here so let us have a brief revision here we have the image acquisition using the single sensor let us have the diagram so in this diagram here it is the single sensor as we can see here power is provided to the sensor so that it can work here so it is the property of the sensing material because of which the information can be acquired here and there should be the illumination of this particular sensor unless it cannot have the information collection here and there it is the mechanical assembly of the filter also and it will generate certain information in terms of the voltage waveform here so this is 
the different information that we have associated to the single sensor here here we have the mechanical assembly here so the sensor is having the motion onto the film here that can finally generate the image here what we call image acquisition here so with the help of multiple such sensors we can say that the image acquisition is possible by the sensor strips here so here it is the visualization of the sensor strip all such sensors are here arranged into the line and they together form the information here the various information in this working for the image acquisition using the sensor strips is there which can have the imaging at the two dimensional and at the three dimensional objects also here it is the visualization of the assembly that works on to it so various applications are there especially into the biomedical applications to have diagnosis of the uh, disease also with the help of x-ray uh, systems here or the scanning of the other types here now as we had the image acquisition using single sensor and here using the strip of the sensors here we can also have the sensor in, uh, arranged into the array form also so this is the image acquisition using sensor arrays here now the different sensors into the array fashion we have ccd array and the motion is obviously not necessary as we have arranged it like this so as we see the image formation for the digital images the simple image formation model i just go next here so where the image can be denoted by f of xy here as we have array type of the sensor and here it is the diagram where we have the scene element here the imaging system and this is what the output into the digital form here so the scene should have been illuminated by source of certain energy here and the reflection can be passing through the imaging system and this is what the internal image that has been formed in this particular device and it is giving us the output so with the help of the sampling and quantization basically this digital image is formed here so it gives us a digital image further we process it so the image sampling and quantization definitely we are going to take the more details into the next lecture here so here as far as the representation of the image is concerned so mathematical representation here we do by this particular expression where we have f of x comma y so it has the part of the illumination and that of the reflection here the ranges of this particular f of x comma y the i of x comma y r of x comma y can be shown in this particular ranges here now to talk about the second part here as we go through this much of information there it is the representation of the digital images so the digital images can be represented as just now the mathematical wave i have gone through so here we have the f of st also that can first of all represent a continuous function and afterwards by processing we can have the digital images that we have represented into f of x y here the x ranges from 0 to capital m minus 1 y ranges 0 to capital n minus 1 here so finally we have the f of x y for the dimensions m by n m number of rows n number of columns so the three basic ways for representation this is the first way this is what the information here we have the grayscale image we have visualization the second type is also there the third type is also there and as far as the mathematics behind this particular image representation is there we can express f of x y as a matrix as a matrix you call or as an array you call so here we have the number of rows here also we have number of columns here so whatever the algebraic operations we can make onto the matrices with the help of these particular operations we can have the further image processing here so each element as represented in this particular mathematical expression we have the pixel the basic entity or the it is also called as pale here 
and the origin of the digital image is at the top right here. So this was all about the image formation and its particular representation here. As far as examination is concerned, the pixel relationships with respect to the images is most of the time concerned here. That also we can cover. So because of the time limitation, we can conclude this particular session here. I don't find any queries from your side. That is why I have covered this much of portion. If you see it later also, so I hope it will be definitely helpful to you because a solid detail of the concept behind how, how exactly we have the formation of the image and its particular representation that we have focused here and further image processing operations definitely we shall cover into the next sessions.